Shoe Dog, Part 10, 1971. Guess who is coming to Gino? Woodell said. He wheeled into my office and handed me the towel. Hitami had accepted my invitation. He was coming to Poland to spend a few days. Then he was going to make a wider tour of the United States. For reasons he declined to show, what it in other potential distributors. I said to Woodell. He nodded. It was March 1971. He vowed that Kitami was going to have the time of his life. That he would return home, feel in love in his heart for America, Oregon, Blair River, and me. When we were young with him, he'd be incapable of doing business with anyone else. And so we agreed the visit should close on a higher note, with a gal a dinner at the home of our prize asset, Bowerman. In mounting this charm offensive, naturally I enlisted Penny. Together we met Kitami's wife, and together we raced straight to the Oregon coast to her parents, Oceanfront Cottage, where we would spend our wedding night. Kitami had a companion with him, a sort of back carrier, personal assistant, a manusus named Hereko Ivano. He was just a kid named Innocent in his early twenties and Penny had him eating out of her hand before we hit Sunset Highway. We both slaved to give the two men an idyllic Pacific Northwest weekend. We sat on the porch with them and breathed in the sea air. We took them for long walks on the beach. We fried them worst class salmon and poured them glass after glass of good French wine. We tried to focus most of our attention on Kitami, but both Bunny and I found it easier to talk to Ivano, who read books and seemed guileless. Kitami seemed like a man who was importing guile by the boatload. Monday, bright and early, I drove Kitami back to Poland to First National Bank, just as I was determined to charm him on this trip. I thought that he could be helpful in charming Wallace, that he could watch for Blue Ribbon and make credit easier to get. White met us in the lobby and walked us into a conference room. I looked around. Where's Wallace? I asked. Ah, White said. He won't be able to join us today. What? That was the whole point of visiting the bank. I wanted Wallace to hear Kitami's ringing and tossman. Oh, well, I thought. Good cop will just have to rely the endorsement to bad cop. I said a few preliminary words, expressed confidence that Kitami could bolster First Nations faith in Blue Ribbon, then turned the floor over to Kitami, who scowled and did the one thing guaranteed to make my life harder. Why did you not give my friend more money? He said to White. What? What? White said. Why do you refuse to extend credit to Blue Ribbon? Kitami said. Pounded his fist on the table. Well, now, White said. Kitami cut him off. What kind of bank is this? I don't understand. Maybe Blue Ribbon would be better off without you. White turned white. I tried to jump in. I tried to rephrase what Kitami was saying. Tried to blame the language barrier. But the meeting was over. White stomped out and I stared the astonishment at Kitami, who was wearing an expression the said, shop well done. I drove Kitami to our new office in Tigard and showed him around, introduced him to the camp. I was fighting hard to maintain my composure, to remain pleasant, to block out all thoughts about what had just happened. I was afraid that at any second I might lose it. But when I sat with Kitami into a chair across from a task, it was he who lost it. I mean, Blue Ribbon felt so disappointed. He said, you should be doing much better. Stunned, he said, that our sales were doubling every year. Not good enough, he snapped. Should we triple some people, say? He said. What people? I asked. Never mind, he said. He took a folder from his briefcase, flipped it open, waited, snapped the chart. He repeated that he didn't like our numbers, that he didn't think we were doing enough. He opened the folder again, shut it again, shut it back into his briefcase. I tried to defend myself, but he waved his hand in disgust. 
back and forth we want for quite a while, so but turned. After nearly an hour of this, he stood and asked to use the mess room, John the hall, I said. The moment he was out of sight, I jumped from behind my desk. I opened his briefcase. I rummaged thorough and took out what looked like the folder he had been referring to. I slid it under my desk, blotter, then jumped behind my desk and put my elbows on the, on the blotter. Waiting for Kitami to return, I had the strangest thought. I recalled all the times I had volunteered with the Boy Scouts, all the times I sat on the Eagle Scout review boat, handing out married bitches for honor and integrity, two or three weekends a year, at question pink check boys about their property, their honesty. Now I was stealing documents from another man's briefcase. I was hiding down a drug pad, no telling where in my lead. Whenever there was no getting around one immediate consequence of my actions, I'd have to recuse myself from the next review board. How I longed to study the contents of the folder, the photocopy, every scrap of paper in it, and go over it all with Virgil. But Kitemi was soon back. I let him resume, scolding me about sluggish numbers, let him chalk himself out. And when he stopped, I summed up my position. Calmly, I said, the Blue Ribbon might increase its sales if you could order more shoes, and we might order more shoes if you have more financing, and our bank might give us more financing if we have more security. Managing a longer contract with Onisuka, again he waved his hand. Excuse, he said. I raised the ideas of funding our orders through a Japanese trading company like Nisuho Ibai, as I mentioned in my wire months before. But, he said, trading companies, they send money first, now later, take over, walk way into your company, then take over. Translation Onisuka was only manufacturing a quarter of his own shoes, subcontracting the other three quarters. Kitami was afraid that Niso would find Onisuka's network of factories then go try to run Onisuka's and become a manufacturer and put Onisuka out of business. Hitami stood. He needed to go back to his hotel. He said, have a rest. I said, I'd have someone drive him, and I'd meet him for a cocktail later at his hotel bar. The instant he was gone, I went and found Virtual and told him what had happened. I held up the folder. I stole this from his briefcase. I said, should he what? Virtual said. He started to act appealed, but he was just as curious as I was about the folder's contents. Together, we opened it and laid it on his desk and found that it contained, among other things, a list of 18 athletic shoe distributors across the United States and a schedule of appointments with half of them. So, there was, and like and like, some people say that some people Demi Blue Ribbon, Poison Kitami against us, were our competitors, and he was on his way to Boston Town. He killed one Marlboro man, 20 more to take his place. I was outraged, of course, but mostly hurt. For seven years, we devoted ourselves to Tiger's shoes, we introduced them to America, we reinvented the lane. Bowman and Johnson had shown Onisuka how to make a better shoe. And the designs were now foundational, setting sales record, changing the face of the industry. And this was how we were repaid. And now I said to Rudolph, I have to go meet this Judas for cocktails. First, I went for a six mile run. I didn't know when I had run harder or been less present in my body. With eat stride, I yelled at the trees, screamed at the cobwebs hanging in the branches. It helped. By the time I showered and dressed and drove to meet Tammy at his hotel, I was almost serene. Or maybe I was in shock. What Kitami said during that hour together was a sad no memory. The next thing I remember is this. The following morning, when Kitami came to the office, Virtual and I were in a sort of shell came. While someone whisked Kitami into the coffee room, Virtual blocked the chair to my office and his future and I split the folder back into the briefcase. 
On the last day of Kitami's visit, hours before the big Chino party, I hurried on to Ogin to confer with Bowman and his lawyer, Chekwa. I left Panin to drag Kitami down later in the day. Thinking, what's the worst that could happen to Panin? He decided, dress smeared with grease, pulling up to Bowman's house. As she stumbled out of the car, I thought for a moment that Kitami had attacked her. But she took me aside and explained that they'd had a fight. The soon of a bitch, she whispered, stayed in the car on the high and let me fix the tire all by myself. I steered her inside. We both needed something strong to train. This wasn't a simple matter. However, Mrs. Bowman, a devout Christian scientist, didn't normally allow alcohol in her home. She was making an exception on this special night. But she'd asked me ahead of time to please be sure that everyone behaved and no one overdid it. So, though my wife and I bought a needed stiff one, I was forced to make it a small one. Mrs. Bowman now gathered us all in the living room in honor of our distinguished case. She announced, tonight we are sewing my ties. A pause. Kitami and I still had at least one thing in common. We both liked my tasks very much. Something about them reminded each of us of Hawaii, that wonderful layover between the West Coast and Japan, where you could unwind before going back into the long work days. So he and I stopped at one that evening, mindful of Mrs. Bowman. So did everyone else. Everyone but Bowman. He'd never been much of a drinker, and he'd certainly never tasted a matai before, and we all was in dread and dismay as the drinks took effect, and then some. Something about the changi combination of crackle, online juice, pineapple and rum, hit Bowman right on the screen. To my test, he was a different person. As he tried to fix his thought, my tie, he blocked. We are out of eyes. No one answered, so he answered himself. No problem. He marched out to the garage, to the large meat freezer, and cracked a pack of frozen blueberries. He tore it open, scattering blueberries everywhere. He then tossed a huge handful of frozen blueberries into his string. Taste battle this way, he announced, returning to the living room. Now, he walked around the room, sloping handfuls of frozen blueberries into everyone's glass. Certain, he began to tell a story, which seemed in highly questionable taste. It built to a crescendo I feared we'd all remember for years to come. That was, if he could, understand the crescendo. Bowman's words, no so precise, were growing squishy around the edges. Mrs. Bowman glared at me, but what could I do? I shrugged my shoulders and thought, you marred him, and then I thought, oh, wait, such a die. But when the Bowman's attended the 1964 Olympics in Japan, Mrs. Bowman had fallen in love with national, which are like small Greek apples, only sweeter. They don't grow in the United States, so she smuggled a few seeds home in her purse and planted them in her garden. Every few years, she told Kitami, when the nashi bloomed, they refreshed her love of all things Japanese. He seemed quite bequeathed by this story. Ouch, Bowman said, exasperated, troubled. I put a hand over my eyes. Finally came the moment when I thought the party might spin out of control when I wondered if we might actually need to call the cooks. I looked across the room and spotted Chekwa sitting beside his wife, glaring at Kitami. I knew that Chekwa had been a fighter pilot in the war, that his wingman, one of his closest friends, had been shot out of the sky by a Japanese hero. In fact, Chekwa and his wife had named their first child after that dead wingman, and I strongly regretted telling Chekwa about Kitami's folder of betrayal. I perceived something bubbling inside Chekwa and rising to his thought, and I sensed the real possibility that Bowman's lawyer and best friend and neighbor might stand and march across the room and soak Kitami in the chalk. The one person who seemed to be having an uncomplicatedly wonderful time was Kitami. Gun was angry. Kitami from Tang, 
Von was called in Kitami from Alphys, talking, laughing, slapping his knees. He was so personable that I wondered what might have happened if I'd given him a metai before driving him over to First National. Late in the evening, he spotted something across the room, a guitar. It belonged to one of Bowman's three sons. Kitami walked over, picked it up, and began to finger the strings, strum them. He carried the guitar to a short flight of steps that led from the Bowman's sunken living room to their dining room and standing on the top step. Started to play and sing. All has turned. Conversation ceased. It was a country western song of some sort, but Kitami performed it like a traditional Japanese folk song. He sounded like Buck Owen on a quarter half. Then, without any sequel, he switched to Also Mile. I recall thinking, Is he really singing Also Mile? He sang a lot of a Japanese businessman strumming a western guitar, singing an Italian ballad in the voice of an Irish tenor. It was surreal. Then a few months passed surreal, and it didn't stop. I didn't never known there were so many voices to also mild. I never known a room full of actors, Westerns or Canyons, could sit so still and quiet for so long. When he sat down, the guitar, we all tried not to make eye contact with each other as we gave him a big hand and clapped, and it all made sense. For Katami, the street to the United States, the visit to the bank, the meetings with me and Gina with the power man. It wasn't about Blue Ribbon, nor was it about any seeker. Like everything else, it was all about Kitami. Kitami left Poland the next day on his not so secret mission. He skilled Blue Ribbon, the pressure of tour of America. I asked the king about the destination and the king, he didn't answer. I said, Steve travels. I traded commission highs, my old boss from Pricewaterhouse to do some consulting work for Blue Ribbon and now I had up with him and tried to decide my next move before Kitami's return. We agreed that the best thing to do was keep the pace. Try to convince Kitami not to leave us, not to abandon us, as angry and bounded as it was. I needed to accept that Blue Ribbon would be lost without Onisuka. I needed, I said, to stick with the towel I knew and persuade him to stick with the towel he knew. Later the week, when the towel returned, I invited him out to Tiger for one more visit before his flight home. I cannot try to raise a bow at all. I brought him into the conference room and we Vujal and I on one side of the table and Kitami and his assistant Ivano on the other. I secured a big smile onto my face and said that we hoped he'd enjoyed his visit to our country. He said, Yet again, that he was disappointed in the performance of Blue Ribbon. This time, however, he said he had a solution. Shoot, I said, sell a shoe company. He said, it's so very softly. The thought crossed my mind. Some of the hardest things I was said in our lifetimes are said softly. Excuse me, I said. Onisuka Co. Limited will buy controlling interest in Blue Ribbon. 51%. It is best deal. For your company and you, you would be wise to accept. A takeover? A hostile freaking takeover? I looked at the ceiling. You gotta be kidding. I thought of all the arrogant, underhanded, ungrateful, bullying, and if we do not, we still we will have no choice but to set up superior distributors. Superior? Oh, oh I see. I what about our written agreement? He shrugged. So much for argument. I couldn't let my mind go to any of those places he was trying to go. I couldn't tell Kitami what I thought of him or where to stick his offer because Heist was right. I still needed him. I had no backup, no plan, B, no exit strategy. If I was going to save Blue Ripon, I needed to do it slowly on my own schedule. So, as not to spot customers and retailers, I needed time and therefore I needed Onisuka to keep sending me shoes for as long as possible. Well, I said, fighting to control my voice. I have a partner, of course, Coach Powerman. I'll have to discuss your offer with him. I was certain Kitami would see through this immaturish style, but he rose his, his pants and smiled. Talk it over with Dr. Powerman. 
get back to me. I wanted to hit him. Instead, I shook his hand. He and Ivano walked out. In the suddenly, Kitami was conference room. Virgil and I stared into the crane of the conference table and let the stillness settle over us. I sent my budget and forecast for the coming year to First National. With my standard credit request, I wanted to send a note of apology begging for forgiveness of the Kitami debacle. But I knew what would roll with it. And besides, Wallace hadn't been thrilled. Days after, White cut my budget and forecast he told me to come in town. He was ready to talk things so well. I wasn't in the head wall this year across from his desk more than two seconds before he delivered news. Well, I'm afraid First National will not be able to do business any longer with Leo Ripon. We will issue no more letters of credit on your behalf. We will pay off your last remaining shipments as they come and with what remains in your account. But when the last bill is paid, our relationship will be terminated. I could see by White's waxy pallor that he was stricken. He had no part in this. This was coming from on high, thus there was no point in arguing. I spread my arms. What do I do, Harry? Find an other bank. And if I can, I'm out of business, right? He looked down at his paper, staked them, fastened them with a paper clip. He told me that the question of Blair Ribbon had cheaply divided the bank officers. Some were for us, some were against. Ultimately, it was Wallace who had cast the deciding vote. I'm sick about this, White said, so sick that I'm taking a sick day. I didn't have that option. I staggered out of First National and drove straight to the U.S. bank. I pleaded with them to take me in. Sorry, they said. They had no desire to buy First National's second-hand problems. Three weeks passed. The company, my company, bought from nothing. And now finishing 1971 with sales of dollar 1.3 million was on life support. I talked with Heiss. I talked with my father. I talked with every other accountant I knew. One of whom mentioned the Bank of California had a charter allowing it to do business in three western states, including Oregon Plus. Bank of Call had a branch in Poland. I hurried over and indeed, they welcomed me, gave me shelter from the storm and a small line of credit. Still, it was only a short-term solution. They were a bank. After all, and banks were, by definition, risk or worse, regardless of my sales. Bank of California would soon be my zero cash balances with the alarm. I needed to start preparing for that rainy day. My thoughts kept returning to that Japanese trading company, the Soho. Late at night, I think they have hundred dollar billion in sales and they want this property to help me. Why? For starters, the Soho to huge volumes on low net margins and therefore it loved growth companies with big upsides. That was us, in spades. In the eyes of us, in First National we had been a landmine. To Nisoho, we were a potential gold mine. So, I went back and met with the man sent from Japan to run the new General Commodities Department, John Sumaragi. A graduate of Tokyo University, the Harvard of Japan, Sumaragi looked strikingly like the great film actor Toshirio Mifun, who was famous for his portrayal of Miyamoto Mushashi. The epic samurai, jealous, and author of the timelines, timeless manual on combat and inner strength. The book of five rings. Sumeragi looked most like the actual one, leaping a lucky streak, and he leaped him aloud, twice as much when he drank. Alec Hayes, however, who drank because he liked the way Booth made him feel. Sumeragi drank because he was lonely in America. Almost every evening after work, he'd head to the Blue House, a Japanese bar restaurant, and talk in his native tongue with the Mama Sen, which just made him lonelier. He told me that Nisoho was willing to take a second position to the bank on their loans. The would certainly quell my bankers. He also opened his nugget of information. Niso had recently dispatched a delegation to Kobe to investigate financing shoes for us and to convince Onisuka to let such a deal go through. But Onisuka had thrown the Niso delegation out on their asses. 
a dollar twenty five million company trained out a dollar hundred billion company. Lisa was embarrassed and angry. We can't introduce you to many quality sports shoes manufacturers in Japan, Sumeragi said, smiling. I pondered. I still held out some hope that Onisuka would come to its sense, to its senses, and I worried about a paragraph in our written agreement forbade me from importing other brands of track and field shoes. Maybe down the road, I said. Sumeragi nodded. All in good time. Wailing from all this drama. I was deeply tired when I returned home each night, but I'd always get a second wind after my six-mile run, followed by a hot shower and a quick chino. Alone, Penny and Matthew ate chino at around four. I'd always try to find time to tell Matthew a bedtime story, and I'd always try to find a bedtime story that will be educational. I invented a character called Matt History, who looked and acted a lot like Matthew Knight and I insulted him into the center of every yawn. Matt History was there at Valley Fall with George Washington. Matt History was there in Massachusetts with John Adams. Matt History was there when Paul Rever rode through the dark of night on a borrowed horse, warning John Henniel, John Hancock, that British were coming. Hard on Rever's heels was a precocious young horseman from the suburbs of Poland, Oregon. Matthew would always laugh, delighted to find himself caught up in these adventures. He'd sit up straighter in bed. He'd beg for more, more. When Matthew was asleep, Penny and I would talk about the day. She'd often ask what we were going to do if it all went soft. I'd say, I can't always fall back on accounting. I did not sound sincere, because I wasn't. I was not delighted to be caught up in these adventure. Eventually, Penny will look away, watch TV, resume her needle point, or read. I'd retreat to my recliner where I'd administer the nightly self calcium Which you know? I know Onisuka can be trusted. What else do you know? I know my relationship with Kitami can't be so wait. What does the future hold? One day or another, Will Ripon and Onisuka are going to break up. I just need to stay together as long as possible while I develop other supply sources so I can manage the breakup. What's step one? I need to scare off all the other distributors Onisuka has lined up to replace me. Blast them right out of the water by firing off letters threatening to sue if they breach my contract. What's step two? Find my own replacement for Onisuka. A flight on the factory I'd heard about in Kuchalachara. The one where Adidas had manufactured shoes during the 1968 Olympics allegedly to skirt Mexican tariffs. The shoes were good, and as I recalled, so I set up a meeting with the factory managers. Even though it was in central Mexico, the factory was called Canada. Right away, I asked the managers why. They chose the name, they said, because it sounded foreign, exotic. I laughed. Canada, exotic. It was more comic than exotic. Not to mention Confucian, a factory south of the border named for a country not of the border. Oh, well, I didn't care. After looking the place over, after taking inventory of their present line of shoes, after surveying the leather room, I was impressed. The factory was big, plain, well run. Plus, it was Adidas in those. I told them I'd like to place an order. 3,000 pairs of leather saucer shoes, which I plan to sell as football shoes. The factory owners asked me about the name of my brand. I told them I'd have to get back to them on that. They handed me the contract. I looked at the dotted line above my name. Pan in hand, I paused. The question was now officially on the table. Was this a violation of my deal with Onisuka? Technically, no. My deal said I could import only Onisuka track and field shoes. No others. It said nothing about importing someone else's football shoes. So, I knew this contract with Canada wouldn't violate the letter of my Onisuka deal. But, the spirit. Six months previously, I would never have done this. Things were different now. Onisuka had already broken the spirit of our deal and my spirit. So, I pulled the cap off my pen and signed the contract. I signed the heck out of that Canada contract. Then, I went out for Mexican food. Now, about the logo, my new saucer 
football shoe would need something to set it apart from from the stripes of Adidas and Onizuka. I recall that young artist I met at Poland State. What was her name? Oh yes, Caroline Davidson. She had been in the office a number of times doing brushes and art flicks. When it got back, Erica, I invited her to the office. I came and told her we needed a logo. What kind? She asked. I didn't know. It said that that gave me a lot to go on. She said. Something that evokes a sense of motion. I said, motion? She said, tubious. She looked confused. Of course, she did. I was babbling. I wasn't sure exactly what I wanted. I wasn't an artist. I showed her the saucer of football shoe and said, unhelpfully, this. We need something for this. She said, she'd give it a try. Motion, she mumbled, leaving my office. Motion. Two weeks later, she came back with a portfolio of rough sketches. They were all variations on a single theme, and the theme seemed to be fat lightning, lightning fat lightning bolts, chubby cheek marks, mobility obese squiggles. Her designs did evoke motion of a kind, but also motion sickness. But also motion sickness. None spoke to me. I singled out a few that held out some promise and asked her to work with those. Days later. Or was it with Carolyn returned and spread a second series of sketches across the conference table. She also hung a few on the wall. She had jumped several dozen more variations on the original theme, but with a free hand, these were better, closer. Vujala and I, and a few others, looked him over. I remember Johnson being too, too, though, why, he'd come out from Wellesley. I can't recall. Gradually, we each toward the consensus, we liked this one slightly more than the other. It looks like a wing, one of us said. It looks like a whoosh of eel, another said. It looks like something a runner might believe in his or her weight. We all agreed it. Looked new, fresh and yet somehow, ancient, timeless. For her many hours of work, we gave Caroline our cheapest thanks and a check for thirty-five dollars, then sent her on her way. After she left, we continued to sit and state at this one logo, which I sort of settled on by default. Something eye-catching about it. Johnson said, Virgil Marquis, I frowned, scratched my cheek. You guys like it more than I do, I said, but we are out of time. It all have to do. It all have to do. You don't like it? Virgil said. I sighed. I don't love it. Maybe it will grow on me. We sent it to Canada. Now we just needed a name to go with this logo I didn't love. Over the next few days, we kicked around dozens of ideas until two leading candidates emerged. Falcon and Dimension 6. I was partial to the level because I was the one who came out with it. Virgil and everyone else showed me that it was good awful. It wasn't catchy, the sound, and it didn't mean anything. We took a poll of all our employees. Secretaries, accountants, sales reps, retail clerks, files clerks, warehouse workers. We demanded that each person champion make at least one suggestion. Ford had just paid a chop flight consulting firm dollar two million to come up with the name of his new maverick. I announced to everyone, we haven't got dollar two million, but we have got fifty spat people, and we can't do any worse than maverick. Also. Unlike Ford, we had a deadline. Canada was starting production on the shoe the Friday. Hour after hour was spent arguing and shouting, debating the virtue of this name or that. Some like Bob's suggestion, Bengal. Someone else said that said the only possible name was Control. I huffed and crossed. Animal names? I said, animal names? We have considered the name of just about every animal in the forest. Must it be an animal? Again and again, I lobbied for Dimension 6. Again and again, I was told by my employees that it was unspeakably bad. Someone, I forget, who summed up the situation neatly. All these names? Suck. I thought it might have been Johnson, but all the documentation says he'd left in compact to while asleep by then. One night, late, we were all tired. Running out of patience, if I heard one more animal name, I was going to jump out a window. Tomorrow is another day, we said, drifting out of the office, out of the office, headed out to our cars. 
I went home and in my recliner, my mind back and forth. Falcon, Bengal, Dimension 6, something else, anything else. The day of the scene arrived. Canada had already started producing the shoes and samples were ready to go in Japan. But before anything could be shipped, we needed to choose a name. Also, we had magazine 8, slated to run, to coincide with the shipment. And we needed to tell the graphic artist what name put in the ad. Finally, we needed to file paperwork with the U.S. Patent Office. Water wheeled into my office. Time's up, he said. I rubbed my eyes. I know. What's it going to be? I don't know. My hair was splitting. By now, the names had all run together into one mind-melting club. Falcon Bengal Dimension 6. There is one more suggestion, Vujal said. From who? Johnson phoned first thing this morning. He said, apparently a new name came to him in a dream last night. I rolled my eyes. A dream? He's serious, Vujal said. He's always serious. He says that Sam bolt upright in bed in the middle of the night and saw the name before him. Virgil said, What is it? I asked, bracing myself. Nike. Ha. Oh, Nike. Spell it. N. I. K. E. Virgil said. I wrote it on the yellow legal pad. The Greek goddess of victory, the Acropolis, the Patinan, the temple. I thought big, briefly, fleetingly. We are out of time, I said. Nike. Falcon. Or Dimension 6. I won't hit Dimension 6. I won't bump me. He frowned. It's your call. He left me. I made doodles on my pad. I made lists. Crossed them out. Tick tock, tick tock. I needed to tallux the factory now. I hated making the scene in a hurry, and that's all I seemed to do in those days. I looked to the ceiling. I gave myself two more minutes to mull over the different options, then walked down the hall to the tallux machine. I said before it, gave myself. Three more minutes. Reluctantly, I punched out the message. Name of name, Prandas. A lot of things were rolling around my head. Consciously, unconsciously. First, Johnson had pointed out the seemingly odd iconic prints. Clorox, Kleenex, Xerox. Have short names, two syllables or less. And they always have a strong sound in the name. A letter like K or X, the six in the mind. That all made sense, and they all described Nike. Also, I liked that Nike was the goddess of victory. Was more important, I thought the inventory. I might have heard in the four races of my mind, Churchill's voice. He asked, "What is our aim?" I can answer in one word: it is victory. I might have recalled the victory medal awarded to all veterans of World War II, a bronze medallion with. Athena, Nike on the front, breaking a sword in two. I might have. Sometimes I believe that I did, but in the end I don't really know what led me to my decision. Look, instinct, some inner spirit. Yes, would you decide? Would you ask me at the end of the day? Nike, I mumbled. Hmm, he said. Yeah, I know. He said. Maybe it'll grow on us? He said. My brand new relationship with this Soho was promising, but it was brand new, and who would dare predict how it might evolve? At once, but the relationship with Onisuka was promising, and look where that stood. This was infusing me with cash, but I couldn't let that make me com complacent. I needed to develop as many sources of cash as possible, which brought me back to the idea of a public offering. I didn't think I could withstand the disappointment of a second field offering, so I plotted with highs to ensure that this one would work. We decided that the first offering hadn't been aggressive enough. We hadn't sold ourselves. This time we hired a hard driving salesman. Also, this time we decided not to sell stocks, but convertible debentures. If business truly is war without bullets, then debentures are very bond. The public loans you money. And in exchange, you give them quasi stock in your cause. The stock is quasi because debenture holders are strongly encouraged and incentivized to hold their shares for five years. After that, they can convert the shares to common stock or get their money back with interest. With our new plan and our Kang Hu salesman, 
we announced in June 1971 that Blue Ribbon will be offering 200,000 shares of debentures at one dollar per, and this time the shares sold fast. One of the first to buy was my friend Kel, who didn't hesitate to cut a check for ten thousand dollars, a princely sum. But he said, "I was still at the start. I will be there at the bitter end." Canada was a let down. The factory slot of football shield was pretty, but in cold weather, its soul split what and crack. Irony upon irony, a shield made in a factory called Canada, which couldn't take the cold. Then again, maybe it was our fault. Using a saucer shoes for football, maybe we were asking for it. The quarterback for Notre Dame wore a pair that season, and it was a thrill to see him trot onto that hallowed great iron at South Bend in a pair of Nikes. Until those Nikes disintegrated, just like the Irish did the Geo. Job one, therefore, was finding a factory that could make studio more weather resistant shoes. They saw sell. They could help. They were only too happy to help. They were beefing up their commodities department. So, Sumaragi had a wealth of information about factories around the world. He'd also recently hired a consultant, a bona fide show wizard, who had been a disciple of Chion Santro. I'd never heard of Santro, but Sumaragi showed me the man was a genius. Had to tow, shoe talk. I'd heard this phrase a few times. Shoe talks were people who devoted themselves wholly to the making, solid, buying, or designing of shoes. Lifers used the phrase cheerfully to describe other lifers, men and women, who had toiled so long and had in the shoe trade. They thought and talked about nothing else or was at all consuming mania. A recognizable psychological disorder to care so much about insults and outsold, lining in the world, rewards and bumps. But I understood the average person takes 7,500 steps a day, 274 million steps over the course of a long life, the equivalent of six times around the globe. Shoe talk, it seemed to me, part of the journey. Shoes were their way of connecting with humanity, were better way of connecting. Shoe talks thought. Then, by refining the hint that joins each person to the world surface, I felt an unusual sympathy for such sad cases. I wondered how many I might have met in my travels. The shoe market just then was flooded with knockoff Adidas, and it was Centro who had unleashed the flood. He was the knockoff king, apparently. He also knew everything worth knowing about Asia's legitimate shoe trade. Factories importing, exporting, he'd help set up a shoe devotion for Mitsubishi, Japan's largest trading company. Nisou couldn't hire Central himself for various reasons, so they hired Central's protege, a man named Seoul. Really? A son, a shoe guy named Seoul? Before meeting Seoul, before going further with Nisou, I considered if I was walking into another trap, if I partnered with Nisou, I'd soon be into them for a lot of money. It also became the source of all our footwear. I would then be even more vulnerable to them than I have been to Onisuka, and if they turned out to be as aggressive as Onisuka, it will be like that. A powerman's suggestion, I talked it over with Chekwa, and he saw the cunning charm. Quite a pickle, he said. He didn't know what to advise, but he knew someone who would. His brother-in-law, Chuck Robinson was CEO of Marcona Mining, which had joint ventures all over the world. Each of the big eight Japanese trading companies was a partner in at least one of Marcona's mines. So, Chuck was arguably the best leading expert on joint business with these guys. I finagled meeting with Chuck at his office in San Francisco and found myself wildly intimidated from the moment I walked in the door. I was a cook at his office size, bigger than my house, and at its view, windows overlooking all San Francisco Bay, with enormous tanker gliding slowly to and from the Wall Creek port, and lining the walls were scale motors of Marcona's tanker fleet. We supplied coal and other minerals to every corner of the globe. Only a man of enormous power and brains could command such a retail. I stammered through my presentation.
but Chuck will manage to quickly get the trapped. He'll boil my complicated situation down to a compelling process. If the Japanese trading company understands the rules from the first day, he said they will be the best partners you'll ever have. Reassured and emboldened, I went back to Samaraki and told him the rules. No equity in my company, ever. He went away and consulted with a few people in his office. Upon returning, he said, No problem, but here's our deal. We take 4% off the top as a markup on product and market interest rates on top of that. I nodded. Days later, Samaragi sent Saul to meet me. Given the month's repetition, I was expecting some kind of colleague figure with 15M, each one waving a wand made out of sheet trees. But Saul was a plain, ordinary, middle aged businessman with a New York accent and a shark skin suit. Not my kind of guy. I wasn't his kind either. And yet we had no trouble finding common ground. Shoes, spot, plus an abiding distance for Kitami. When I mentioned Kitami's name, Saul scoffed the mask and asked, We are going to be fast friends at top. Saul promised to help me beat Kitami, get free of him. I can solve all your problems, he said. I know factories, factories that can make Nikes. I asked, handed him my new football shoe. I can think of five off the top of my hand. He was adamant. He seemed to have two mental states, adamant and dismissive. I realized that he was selling me, that he wanted my business, but I was willing to be sold and more than ready to be wanted. The five factories, so mentioned were all in Japan. So, Sumeragi and I decided to go there and look them over in September 1971. So, agreed to be our guide. A week before we were to leave, Sumeragi phoned. Mr. Saul has suffered a heart attack. He said, Oh no, I said, he's expected to recover. Sumeragi said, But traveling at this time is impossible. His son, who is very capable, will take his place. Sumeragi sounded as if he was trying to convince himself more than me. I flew all into Japan and met Sumeragi and Sol Chiar at his host's office in Tokyo. I was taken back when Sol Chiar stepped forward, hand outstretched. I assumed he'd be young, but he looked like a teenager. I had a hunch he'd be dressed in shark skin, like his father, and he was, but his suit was three sizes too big. Was it, in fact, his father's? Unlike so many teens, he started every sanasan with I, I think this, I think that, I, I, I. I shared a glance at Samuragi, who looked incredibly concerned. The first of the factories was wanted to see was outside Hiroshima. All three of us went there by train, arriving midday. A cool, overcast afternoon. We weren't you at the factory until the next morning, so I felt it's important to take the extra time and visit the museum. And I wanted to go by myself. I told Samaragi and Sol Chia I viewed meet them in the hotel lobby the following morning. Walking through those museum rooms, I couldn't take it all in. I couldn't process it. Many coins dressed in signed clothes. Clumps of sourced, clumps of scars. Irritated, jewelry. Tokyo. I couldn't tell. Photos that took me to place for far beyond emotion. I stood in horror before a child's liquefied tricycle. I stood open mouthed before the blackened skeleton of a building where people had lived and walked and loved until I tried to feel and hear the moment of impact. I felt sick at heart as I turned a corner and came upon a scarce shoe. And the place, the footprint of its owner still visible. The next morning, these ghastly images were fresh in my head. I was somber, heavily subdued, as I drove the Samaragi and Sol Chiar into the countryside, and I was almost startled. And I was almost startled by the culture of factory officials. They were delighted to meet up, to show us their wares. Also, they said forthrightly. They were most eager to do a deal. They alone been hoping to crack the U.S. market. I showed them the cutters, asked how long it might take a produce a sizable order of this shoe. Six months, they said. Solchiar stepped forward. You'll do it in three? 
he barked. I gasped. With the exception of Kitami, I'd always found the Japanese unfallingly polite, even in the heat of disagreement or intense negotiation, and I'd always tried to reciprocate. But in Hiroshima, of all places, I felt that politeness was that much more essential. Here, if nowhere else or not, humans should be gentle and kind with one another. So cheer up was anything but the ugliest of Americans. It got worse. As we made our way across Japan, he was rescued, boorish, certain, swaggering, condescending to everyone we met. He embarrassed me, embarrassed all Americans, now and then. Sumeragi and I exchanged paint looks. We wanted desperately to scold Sol Jr. to leave him, but we needed his father's contacts. We needed this horrid brat to show us where the factories were. And Karium, just outside Beppo, in the southern Aswine, we visited a factory that was part of a visit, part of a vast industrial complex run by the Bristone, the company, Bristone Tire Company. The factory was called Nippon Trouble. It was the biggest shoe factory I'd ever seen. A kind of shoe O's, capable of handling any order, no matter how big or complicated. We sat with factory officials in their conference room just after breakfast. And this time, when Sol Chia tried to speak, I didn't let him. Each time he opened his mouth and spoke up, cut him off. I told officials the kind of chill we wanted, showed them the cutters. They nodded gravely. I wasn't sure they understood. After lunch, we returned to the conference room, and there before me on the table was a brand new cutters. Nike side straight and all hot off the factory floor magic. I spent the rest of the afternoon describing the shoes I wanted. Tennis, basketball, high top, low top, plus several more models of running shoes. The officials insisted they would have no trouble making any of these designs. Fine, I said, but before placing an order, I will need to see samples. The factory officials assured me that they could blast out, sample and ship them within days too. The south office in Tokyo. We bowed to each other. I went back to Tokyo and waited. Taste and taste of crisp fall weather. I walked around the city, trying, spoil and save. Ate jacketory and drink of shoes. I revisited the Michi Gardens and saw Bonita Ginkos beside the cherry gate, potted to the sacred. On Sunday, I got a notice at my hotel. The shoes had to arrive. I went down to the offices of the soul, but they were closed. They had trusted me enough to give me a pass, however, so I let myself in and sat amid rules and throws a fact to test, inspecting the samples. I held them to the light, turned them this way and that. I ran my fingers all in the soles, all in the cheek, or wing, or whatever our new sight stripe would be called. They were not perfect. The logo on this shoe wasn't quite straight. The missile on that shoe was a bit too thin. There should be more left on this other one. I made notes for the factory officials, but minor imperfections aside, they were very good. Alas, the only thing to do was think up names for the different models. I was panicked. I'd done such a poor job thinking up a name for my new brand. Dimension 6. I wanted blue ribbon, still mocked me. I'd only gone with Nike because I was... Out of time, and because I trusted chances like nature, now I was on my own in an empty office building in downtown Tokyo. I'd have to trust myself. I held up the tennis shoe. I decided to call it the Wimbledon. Well, that was easy. I held up another tennis shoe. I decided to call it the Forest Hill. After all, that was the starting for the first U.S. Open. I held up a basketball shoe. I called it the Blazer. After my hometown in beauty, I held up an other basketball shoe and named it the Prune because the best college basketball team of all time was John Virgin Prunes. Not too creating path. Now the running shoes, cottage of coast and mountain. And Aubrey and Bluestone and Falland. I was full in it. 
I was in the zone. I started dancing around the room. I had a secret music. I had up a running shoe. I named it the West Flight Boom. I said, to this day, I don't know where the name came from. It took a half hour to name them all. I felt like colorists writing Kill Block Pan in the opium days. I didn't mail my names off to the factory. It was dark as I walked out of the office, welded into the crowded, choky street. A feeling came over me like anything I'd ever experienced. I felt spent but proud. I felt trained but exhilarated. I felt everything I ever hoped to feel after a day's walk. I felt like an artist, a creator. I looked back over my shoulder, took one last look at the soul's offices. Under my break, I said, we made this. I'd been in Japan three weeks, longer than I expected, which posed two problems. The world was large, but the shoe world was small, and if Onisuke's got wind that I was in their neighborhood and she didn't stop by, they'd know I was up to something. It wouldn't take much for them to find out or figure out that I was lining up to a replacement, so I needed to go down to Ko, make an appearance at Onisuke's offices, but extending my trip being gone from home another week was unacceptable. Fanny and I had never been apart alone. I felt her and asked her to fly over and join me for this last day. Fanny jumped at the chance. She had never seen Asia, and this might be her last chance before we were out of business and out of money. It might also be her last chance to use that matching pink luggage and door was available for babysitting. The flight was long. Though, and Penny didn't like planes, when I went to the Tokyo airport to meet her, I knew I'd be collecting a fragile woman. I forgot, however, how intimidating Haneda Airport could be. I was a solid mess of parties and baggage. I couldn't move, couldn't find Penny. Suddenly, she appeared at the sliding glass doors of customs. She was trying to push forward, trying to get through. There were too many people and employees on every side of her. She was trapped. The doors slid to open. The crowd surged forward and Penny fell into my arms. I'd never seen her so exhausted, not even after she gave birth to Matthew. I asked if the plane had a flight time and she'd gotten out to change it. Choke, Kitami, remember. She didn't laugh. She said the plane hit turbulence two hours outside. Tokyo and the flight was a roller coaster. She was wearing her best line green suit not badly wrinkled and stained, and she was the same shade of light cream. She needed a hot shower and a long rest and some fresh clothes. I told her we had a suit waiting at the front of the designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. A half hour later, when we pulled up to the hotel, she said she was going to us to use the ladies' room while I checked us in. I hurried to the front desk, got our room keys, and sat on one of the lobby sofas to wait. Ten minutes. Fifteen minutes. I went to the door of the ladies' room and cracked the turban. Honey, I'm frozen. She said, What? I'm on the floor of the ladies' room and I'm frozen. I went in. I found her on the cold child, lying on her side, ladies tapping over and around her. She was having a panic attack and swear leg cramps. The long flight, the child at the airport, the months of stress about Kitami, it was too much for her. I spoke calmly, told her everything would be fine, and gradually she unclenched. I helped her to her feet, guided her upstairs, and asked the hotel to send up a Matthew. As she lay on the bed, washed clothes on her forehead. I was worried, but a little bit grateful. I'd been on the edge of panic for weeks, months. The sight of Pani in the state gave me a shot of Antorina Lane. One of us had to keep it together for the sake of Matthew. This time, it would have to be me. The next morning, I found Onisuka and told them my wife and I were in Japan. I'm on John, this time. Within an hour, we were on the train for Kobe. Our one came out to meet us, including Kitami and Fujimoto and Mr. Onisuka. What brings you to Japan? I told them we were vocational. Super of the moment thing. Very good. Very good. Mr. Onisuka said. We made a big fuss over Pani and we sat down to a hastily arranged tea ceremony. For a moment, amid all the small talk, all the laughter and pleasantries, it was possible to forget that we were on the edge of war. Mr. Onisuka even offered a car and driver to take Pani and me around 
and show us school. I accepted. Then Kitami invited us to dinner that night. Again, I reluctantly said yes. Fujimoto came along, which added an extra layer of complexity, and looked around the table and thought, my pride, my enemy, my spy, some light. Though the tone was friendly, cordial, I could feel the tangled subtext of every remark, I was like loose by a basset and spark it in the big crown. I kept waiting for Kitami to come out with it, pressed me for an answer to his offer to buy Blue Ribbon. Utterly, he never brought it up. Around 9 o'clock, he said he needed to be getting home. Fujimoto said he'd stay and have a night cap with us. The moment Kitami was gone, Fujimoto told us everything he knew of the plan to cut off Blue Ribbon. It wasn't much more than a glance from the photo in Kitami's briefcase. Still, it was nice to see with an alley, so we had several nightcaps and a few laughs. Auntie Fujimoto looked at his watch and let out a scream. Oh no, it's actually 11. The train stopped running. Oh, no problem, I said. Can you stay with us? We have a big tatami in our room. Penny said, you can sleep on that, Fujimoto accepted with many bows. He thanked me yet again for the bicycle. An hour later, there we were in one small room, pretending there was nothing out of the ordinary about the three of us, batting down together. As always, I heard Fujimoto get up, cough and stretch. He went to the bathroom, ran the water, brushed his teeth, then he put on his clothes from the night before his sleep. Before, I slipped out. I fell back asleep, but a short while, Laura Penny went to the bathroom, and when she came back to bed, she was laughing and rolled over. No, she was crying. She looked as if she was on the verge of another panic attack. He used. She rasped. What? He said. She buried her head in the pillows. He used. My toothbrush? As soon as it got back to Oregon, I invited Powerman up to Poland to meet with me and Vuto. Talk about the state of the business. It seemed like any old meeting. At some point in the course of conversation, Wojtel and I pointed out that the outer sole of the training shoe hadn't changed in 50 years. The track was still just waves of crops across the bottom of the foot. The cottage and Boston were breakthroughs in cushioning and nylon, revolutionary in upper construction, but there hadn't been a single innovation in outer sole since before the Great Depression. Bowman nodded. He made a note. He didn't seem all that interested. As I recall, once we covered all the new business on the agenda, Bowman told us that a wealthy alum had just donated a million dollars to Oregon, earmarked for a new track, the world's finest. His voice rising, Bowman described the surface he'd created with that windfall. It was polyurethane, the same spongy surface that was to be used in Munich in the 1972 Olympics, where Bowman was on top to be head coach of the track team. He was pleased, and yet, he said, he was far from satisfied. His runners still weren't getting the full benefit of this new surface. The shoes still weren't creeping it right. On the two-hour drive back to Arjun, Bowman milled what Virtual and I had said, and milled his problems with the new track, and these two problems simmered and congealed in his thoughts. The following Sunday, sitting over breakfast with his wife, Bowman's gaze drifted to her waffle iron. He noted the waffle iron's credit pattern. It confirmed with a certain pattern in his mind's eye, a pattern he'd been seeing or seeking for months, if not years. He asked Mrs. Bowman if he could borrow it. He had a wet of urethane in his carriage, left over from the installation of the track. He carried the waffle iron out to the carriage filled it with urethane, heated it up, and promptly rounded. it. The urethane scaled it shut, because Bowman hadn't added a chemical releasing agent. He didn't know from chemical releasing agent, and other person would have quit right then. But Bowman's brain also didn't have a releasing agent. He bought another vehicle iron, and this time filled it with plaster. And when the plaster hardened the jaws of the vehicle iron open, no problem. He took the resulting mold to the Oregon Rubber Company and paid them to 
pour liquid rubber into it. Another failure. The rubber mold was too wretched, too brittle. It broke right away. But Bowman felt he was getting closer. He gave up the vapor iron altogether. Instead, he took a sheet of stainless steel and punched it with holes, creating a vapor-like surface and brought this back to the rubber company. The mold they made from the steel was pliable, walkable, and Bowman now had two foot-sized squares, hard rubber knobs, which he brought home and swayed to the sole of a pair of running shoes. He gave these to one of his runners. The runner laced them. The runner laced them on and ran like a rabbit. Bowman found me excited and told me about his experiment. He wanted me to send a sample of his vehicle sole shoes to one of my new factories. Of course, I said, I sent it right away to Nippon Rubber. I looked back over the tackies and see him toiling in his workshop. Mrs. Bowman carefully helping, and I get goosebumps. He was Addison in Manlo Park, the Wancy in Florida, Tesla in Warden Cliff, Davy only in Spide. I wonder if he knew, if he had any clue that he was a dangerous of sneakers, that he was making history, remarking an industry, transforming the way athletes would run and stop and jump for generations. I wonder if he could conceive in that moment all that he had done. All that would fall, I know I couldn't.